think, yeah, when I first saw the footage, um, I, I was just blown away by sort of like the way the board was positioned in the water and you can sort of almost see how like the rail cutting through that face on, you know, your yeah. inside toe and your heel side. Um, yeah. that was sort of very interesting to me from an analytical point of view. Um, right. especially like, you know, the displacement of water using say a round pin versus like a squash tail. Like I, I, I've never really been aware of it and understood the dynamics of water displacement when it comes to a surfboard. So when I looked at this footage, I think that sort of was very interesting to me. Interesting. And so what is the right craft to ride at a wave like J-Bay? Because you say that it's super fast, um, so you obviously need a lot of speed. I mean, this is yeah. probably the perspective because it's a GoPro, but the board looks pretty narrow. Um, you know, what? how do you pick how do you pick your equipment? Like how wide is that board and you know, how much volume is on it relative, uh, you know, and thickness and, and all that relative to kind of what you might ride at, I don't know, a beach break or something like that. Yeah. I think JV has been a bit of a weird one for me. I must say it's like, even though I've grown up there, I've always struggled with boards in a sense, because it's not like a heavy wave. It's not like a sunset or a Haliva. You know, you don't necessarily need like a gun at j yeah. but it's not soft. It's almost like in between. So, you know, when I was starting to surf supers more regularly when I was younger, like I would always take out these boards that were round pins and there was just too much hold and like it just felt a bit sluggish. So over the years, I've sort of like developed a board where it's a, a, a rounded squash tail and it sort of just gives you that combination of like release off the top hold during a, um, like a, a rail carve and speed down the line just to like give you the full combination of riding a wave out of JB to the best of its ability um, or that it has to offer. So I think, yeah, I don't think necessarily that, you know, you need a gun or a small wave board. Like I think it's almost like an in-between. It's Got almost it. like, if you want to get a small wave board yeah. that has a lot of hold or yeah. all round board that has a lot of hold, that's like the perfect board for J-Bay. And that's yeah. whenever I got like a quiver of boards and I felt like it was just too much hold at a, at a beach break or a wave that, you know, it was small and it just, just, just didn't feel like it wanted to go. I kind of thought like, okay, let me just try this board out of J-Bay. And then those would generally be the boards that just felt great out there. Yeah. So this looks like kind of your, just your typical high performance shortboard. Um, and that, you know, cause at a wave at J-Bay, like J-Bay, it seems like, you know, the, cause you got good size, you got good power. You don't need the board to generate the speed for you too much, like a small wave board. And, but it's not like, like you said, it's not like sunset. So just kind of that in between yeah. perfect rippable kind of wave and okay, got it. And so I'm curious, yeah, you know, sure. I mean, because obviously you're an extremely high level surfer, you know, um, oh, what, you. <laughs> what, hey, what, um, you know, you said that you were critical, but less on the critical side, but like, what things do you focus on at your level? Um, I really enjoy flow. I think having an element of flow in your surfing for me, I just think that that is the, the ultimate point is when like, you know, everything just connects. And it's just like you're in constant flow with the wave, you're in constant rhythm with the wave, and you're not doing double pumps, you're not trying to milk the wave for more than what it's worth. I feel like when I was competing, I was doing that a lot. I was no. sort of like over surfing a wave. And I just don't feel like for me that was how I wanted to surf, but I was just surfing to get the score. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to like being critical of my surfing, and maybe it's just because I've grown up at such a perfect wave. Like if you surf J Bay and you don't know how to sort of ride the wave to how it or for what it offers, it, it, it highlights that sort of um, that you know inability to surf the wave. So for me, when I I surf now, I just when things flow together, like if I'm able to do like a snap you know, and come out of it and into like a lip line floater and from that lip line floater generate speed. And then there's sort of an air reverse section and, and I'm able to link those three manu maneuvers in. 
with just like no double pumps. Like for me, I, I love that. I love that feeling of like pure execution without having to look messy in a sense. Right. I mean, I, did you just watch, you know, Tom Kern at J-Bay surfing his first wave on like repeat as a, as a kid, <laughs> especially being yeah, you know, from like J-Bay? Yeah, that is, that is a perfect example of just like, you know, perfect surfing at J-Bay. And yeah. to be honest, it was his first wave. Like that blows my mind. That's so insane, right? Oh my God. His bottom turns in that section. I mean, they're just the most beautiful thing. It's so, and what he does with his head too, just like look straight to the beach and then go for that bottom turn and just like rip right up. It's just, it's just insane. gorgeous. Insane. I think these guys that just have a knack out of J-Bay, like Mick Fanning, um, he's probably my favorite surfer out of J-Bay. Um, Tom Curran, like Joel Parkinson. They just there's just such a flow element to their surfing, and I think um, I think that that just appeals to me more than anything, you know. Yeah, man, that must be so good to just surf a wave like this with perfect flow and just like feel like everything fits together. And I guess you know it's interesting when you say that it must feel like this I don't know synchronicity with the ocean when you have that perfect flow. It's like your maneuvers perfectly match the wave, and everything just lines up perfectly um that must be kind of the most beautiful feeling yeah yeah for sure for sure i think you know obviously i was competing for a very long time um and soon as i sort of stopped competing it almost felt like i was surfing for myself and um yeah i think i think i sort of became a lot more connected with sort of my feelings for surfing and Mm -hmm. what i wanted to get out of surfing Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think I sort of found like a bit of a connection there to what would bring me joy to my surfing instead of like winning heats, you know. And I think that sort of that feeling of connection with the wave and um, that flow element uh, that brings me a lot of joy these days. Got it. Actually, you know what? This is something I- I'd be interested in in diving in with you. So, you know, you had to probably go from surfing perfect J Bay to then surfing on the QS and just like one foot beach breaks what was what was that like that must have been tough right or it was it was very tough for sure like i think i definitely had a disadvantage in that sense because sure i j bay is a perfect wave um you get a lot of repetitions on your waves you get to practice different maneuvers and i think you form a very like interesting style in the sense that like your surfing becomes quite refined but the unpredictability of beach breaks becomes an issue when you're trying to compete on the QS. Um, and from when I started surfing at places like, you know, Pantene in Spain, um, Lacanau in France, Australia, Manly Beach, um, it just, that became very difficult for me. And yeah, it, it definitely, yeah, it definitely was a bit of a, a disadvantage. And I just, I started to practice more and more, but when you've grown up on surfing, you know, point breaks, it's it's sort of like ingrained in you to like, you know, wait for the best wave, you know. Um, you don't necessarily have to hunt because you know it's going to come in the exact same point um, or a few meters out. So, yeah, I think that was certainly my biggest disadvantage on the QS. <laughs> but it's so weird because, you know, you go... You go from J Bay, then you have to surf like one foot crap at a beach break. But then if you make it to the C T then it's back to the other approach, which is wait for the best wave because you're gonna be at a perfect wave or not a perfect wave, but you know, like a really good wave. And then you kinda have this whole mind shift then as well. It must be such so difficult for, you know, surfers to adapt to all that. Um Yeah, but, it's it's pretty tough. Yeah. So I guess you know, going, and I guess the hardest part must be like, oh, it's pumping and perfect at JB. I'm going to go practice at this one foot crap beach break. Like, did, did that ever happen where you like give up perfect waves to just go surf dribble? Oh, or? so many times. I remember like being in the, um, or being in like Europe and doing that European leg. So you start in Lacanar, you go Pantene. I know I mentioned this. And then, you would go to Eresera in Portugal, then you go to Morocco, but it's summer there. So, you know, sure, the beaches are nice, it's warm, but the waves are two foot. 
And, you know, I'm sitting on social media, just seeing perfect waves come through a J-Bay and you're like, is this winning? Oh is this is this is this what I'm meant <laughs> to be doing for the rest of my life? You know, <laughs> no. Or until uh, I retire, like I don't know. It was um, it was definitely that's hard to watch that. Um, yeah. But I mean, I served J Bay as good as it gets. So you know, when I was traveling, I would just tell myself like, you know, you you served it good. Like, you know, I'd message a local guy and be like, hey, how was that swell? And he'd be like, oh, it wasn't that great. You know, just to get an accurate depiction of how it was you know because everyone will be like it's pumping but i know there's there's a few local guys that'll tell me like nah it actually wasn't that great it was too south <laughs> yeah got it well you know what's interesting then you know what so going from surfing perfect waves and then having to adapt your style to like small crappy beach breaks what did you what did you learn from that you know how did you get good i mean because that's what you had to do in order to you know compete mm-hmm. at that level how did you get how did you figure out how to surf small crappy beach breaks what was your approach and and what kind of things do you think you learned so i think one of the most important things that i needed to work on was my quiver like my boards were very very refined they were very thin they had like perfect for point breaks or when there's like a steep face to it you know my boards were able to fit in those pockets perfectly and i was able to release but as soon as it went like absolutely gutless um and i had to manufacture and look messy in my surfing (laughs) like that i felt i struggled with with my boards because then i would just feel like i threw a lead weight off the back of my board um but i must say i'm i was in australia and i actually got a few boards from Ol emery so he's based in byron bay i don't know if you know adam melling adam melling used to ride his boards um and from there i kind of like felt like oh wow like you know these boards are are, are great because um so just just riding and getting the feel for an australian for australian boards and by an australian shaper that sort of changed my approach um but it it became very difficult for me to get boards from australia um so i actually i've got a local shaper now that's obviously been i've been with for a good few years now and he's he's helped me sort of like build on that that small wave board um um quiver and yeah other aspects i would say is like obviously putting the time in. like i would go to seals beach break which is a beach break just like 30 minutes from jeffrey's bay and i'll just put as much time in as i can and like beach break waves um and when i would stay in cape town i would actually serve a wave called musenberg it's very soft um but yeah i think just putting that time in you know, another element that comes into, you know, growing up in Jeffrey's Bay is there's hardly any left. <laughs> so it, uh, yeah, it's, you know, me surfing at J-Bay, like my point was, you know, really good, I felt. But going left was just, um, yeah, that was also definitely a challenge. So we also have like a wave sort of just on the other side of Super Tubes, uh, maybe like one or two beaches across um but it was like a two foot beach break so whenever it was working we would like well not two foot beach break it was like a two foot kind of like how can i say sort of like a rock shelf that went left but it wasn't spectacular at all but whenever it was breaking we would just like be like oh we we should go surf it you know just to get that practice in um so yeah on the basis of that it kind of like sort of helped me improve my small wave surfing and beach breaks and um and obviously left all right so Going from surfing perfect rights all the time to surfing small crappy left, what was uh, were there any unlocks for you that helped you get better going backside? Do you remember any breakthroughs or things like ah, I made this little adjustment and it really opened things up, or was it just putting the time in? I think one of the biggest adjustments that helped my backhand surfing or my backhand snaps because I think when you're competing on the QS, you want to look explosive. You want to look like when you hit that lip, you're throwing spray. And I was actually in Huntington Beach and my friend Christian Sines, he said to me, he was like, oh, just just drop that right hand when you're doing your bottom turn and it'll allow you to sort of like draw out your bottom turn a little bit more and come sort of off the bottom and more vertical to get like underneath that lip. Um, And I think, I don't know if it's like, you almost de- delay your bottom turns when you drop that right hand, but it allowed you to sort of like pivot your board and get more vertical and allow you to sort of hit the lip and project more spray. 
off the off the off the face or the section you want to hit. And interesting. When... Can I ask a question about that? Yeah, sure. So you're saying so you're a regular footer, so you're using your backhand and touching it down. So your right arm, right? And so this yes, is your out- exactly. your outside arm. And you're doing this during your bottom turn. So you're kind of getting your, your backhand closer to the rail as you're doing your bottom turn. Yes. So it's kind of like if you see guys bottom turning on a massive wave um, and wanting to sort of wind it up and hit it, you'll sort of see them like grab their rail and like almost act like as a leverage just to like pivot off that bottom and then allow them to sort of come up and then hit that lip. It's sort of the same sort of action just on like a three foot wave. Um, you're sort of dropping it down and instead of, I was bottom turning and my, my hand was like here yeah. where it should be like down here, you know? And when I saw the footage and the difference between the two bottom turns, I was like, wow, this is night and day kind of thing, you know? And yeah, so from then I sort of like tried to focus on dropping that right hand, but it's weird because some surfers don't necessarily do it and their bottom to top turns look perfectly fine. Um, but for me personally, that like helped my backhand snaps quite a bit. Interesting. And yeah. so that just allowed you to get more vertical. And obviously with your backhand snaps, I think you can generally get a little bit more vertical on that, but, um, Wow, that's really cool. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I think in at Huntington Beach in particular, it's almost like, I don't know if it's the South Wolves, but they sort of like come down the beach and the left kind of bend away from you, but then the right's bend at you. So, you know, you're kind of like coming off your bottom turn and you're like looking up and it almost feels like the wave, because it's bending at you, there's not much power. And when I was sort of coming up with these bottom turns and not coming deep off that bottom turn. It, it, it just didn't allow me to sort of like hit it nicely. Um, but as soon as I did that, it was like, yeah, it, it just made a difference that I was like, wow, this is quite, quite valuable. Um, now that was probably the, one of the biggest takeaways I took from surfing or improving my backend surfing. Got it. Cool. And you obviously had a good measure of success you were in uh you know you got a wild card spot at j-bay what was what was that like surfing and in, in making it to that level um where you i mean you probably were surfing against your heroes as a child probably right what was that like yeah that was it was definitely one of the best experiences of my life uh yeah i look back at that memory fondly and chief i wish they would bring back the event now and the trials because yeah the trials is, was what i want to compete in um, Yeah. But for me, yeah, that was just amazing. I, I was very nervous. I was young at the time. I think I was like 18 years old. And yeah, my very first heat, it was like Kelly Slater and Mitch Cruz, who is a good friend of mine. Um, but yeah, just being in a heat with Kelly, I was like, this is absolutely surreal, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think I wish the waves were better. The waves were a little bit weird that day. It was like kind of like an onshore crumble. Um, and yeah, it, it wasn't the cleanest swell, but yeah, the, the memory of just like being like surfing in front of your friends and your family and they all supporting you and rooting for you. Like, uh, I'll remember that to, to the day I die. That's for sure. Like as one of the fondest memories. Wow. And you'd have like your whole hometown crowd cheering you on. You're the local, you know, you're the local guy. And, yeah. Oh man, that must've been Yeah, it, it was amazing. Hey. Yeah. So did... Um, did Kelly play any mind games on you or? <laughs> no, he, um, I mean, I was doing pretty good in the beginning. Like I, I had two ways, which I think were okay. And then um, I think, I can't remember. I, I had my second best ride and then I was paddling back out and I was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of in this. Like I, I could be Kelly. I could be Kelly. And then obviously Kelly does what he does. And he came flying past me in a day where there was no barrels, but he got barreled and he came out in front of me. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Like, just, just calm down, Dole. You're not going to beat him in this heat. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it was so cool. Like, oh, man. regardless if I came second or third in that heat, I was just so stoked. But for a second, you're like, I might be Kelly Slater. That was going on in your <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, but oh, uh, yeah. I think 
think you would need to be in like a wave pool setting and uh, the time's running out and there's absolutely no waves coming. Someone just presses the button. <laughs> That's the only time you can beat Kelly Slater. Right, right. So mentally though, was there any like, how, how did you deal with just stepping up to this whole nother level and competing at this world stage against your heroes? And did you, I'm sure you, you mentioned you were nervous, but was there anything that helped you get over that nervousness or? Um, geez, I was so young at the time. Like I struggled to deal with my anxiety when competing. Um, only like towards the end of my surfing career, I sort of, I found that mojo as to how to relax and just let go and like sort of let the ocean dictate um, how you should perform in a, in, in a heat. Um, yeah, because I was just, you know, I was spinning. I was like, you know, my dad said I was shaking. Even Kelly said in his interview that I looked nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 I always rise to the occasion though when I come, when I have like a lot of anxiety, which I, I'm sort of grateful that I have that attribute. But yeah, only towards the end of my surfing career in 2019, like that was the best year that I had, um, which was just before COVID. I, um, I sort of, started speaking to a psychologist in a sense. Um, I don't if, no, know if she was really a psychologist, but she helped me sort of let go of, you know, I'm, I'm very focused in the sense that like, I have to do everything right. I have to train, I have to eat correct. I have to surf a certain amount of hours a day. I have to like, and I treated it like a job. Um, and I think I lost the fun element. And as soon as I started just like incorporating that into my surfing again, it was like things were just, coming my way and you know when it gets to like five minutes left in the heat and you know you need that score to make it through the wave would just come and I'd be like whoa like things are just um falling together for me and I had a lot of heats where I just sort of let everything go and just kind of use my intuition instead of like okay this is where I'm going to sit this is you know I need to kept the first wave of the heat and I need to do this maneuver or I need to do that. I was just like, I'm going to go out there, surf my heat and feel out the conditions. I kind of have like a vague idea of what to do, but it's not cast in stone. And that helped my surfing um, from a competitive point of view, for sure. Interesting. And I think that's, most people aren't going to be surfing, you know, at, at your level, but I think it's for, still highly relevant to anybody you know you could be a beginner surfer and you're out there for the first time in some you know proper waves and you feel intimidated in a lineup um and i think what you said is just kind of spot on and it's probably going to help i've definitely had those moments on you know surfing myself where i'm out there and i'm like man i'm not getting the waves i want this crowd is this and that and then i just like all right you know what i should be grateful to be out here and then things just start going my way and i can totally see that interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think when you're surfing or free surfing, you kind of paddle out and you're there to sort of vent and just become relaxed. And I think a lot of people got to vent that in the surf and sometimes they sort of, you know, they're not in that flow state. And I think after you've caught a few waves, you eventually start to like break into that flow state. You know, it's almost like if you paddle out and you get one wave off the bat, it's almost like, okay, my surf's done. Like, I don't you know. I, I'm content with whatever else happens because I got that bomb. And that was kind of like sort of what I was putting into my competitive surfing. It was almost like I've caught that bomb before I've even paddled out into the heat, you know? Yeah. Um. So, yeah. I guess. And then usually when you catch that bomb right off the bat, then you're just in the rhythm and then they just keep coming, right? And yeah. So, yeah. Because then there's no pressure. You're just like, well, I'm out here to have fun, you know? Yeah. Um, it's not going to be necessarily a bad surf, but I've just come out here to, to have fun, you know? Um, yep. So that's sort of the approach I try to, to sort of have with my competitive surfing was like, you know, just go out there, have fun, regardless of the result is what it is, you know? It's not going to help if you put the pressure on because putting that pressure on is just going to make you overthink it and just like, you know, it's just a spiral out of control. Hey everyone, if you like this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button down there and check out our other videos because we got tons of great content to help you improve.